She's like bulletin on the spot. If you do not have a bulletin, raise your hand and Courtney Thor will bring you one. Does everybody have a bulletin? You're gonna need a bulletin. If you don't have one, raise your hand. All right. All right, is everybody settled? Everybody settled. So I had an interesting uh, night last night thought I'd tell you guys about real quick. I showed up here last night to had an awesome members meeting where everybody gets to come and we had some awesome free shanes and we got to listen to Pastor Jeff. And when I show up, I have a couple people, one of them being... Uh, Rhonda Dawes, uh, the pastor's wife, tell me, hey, um, I heard something, I heard your name on the news this week, and it was really disturbing. And so, and then somebody else walked up to me and said, hey, I heard your name on the news this week, I'm glad that wasn't you. And I'm like, what are they talking about? So I do a quick Google search of Brandon Keller in the news, and come to find out this last week, some 20-year-old guy named Brandon Michael Keller, which is actually my entire name, Brandon Michael Keller, has the exact same name, only he's 20, um, was arrested for trying to solicit sex from a 15-year-old girl. So, all these people at church are asking me, hey, that wasn't you, right? And I'm like, well, no, it wasn't me. I'm not 20. I'm twice that age. So, if any of your parents have heard it was not me. That's all I'm saying. I'm not 20. I'm not from Dawsonville or wherever that happened. But wherever it was, it wasn't me. So, anyway, bad. You gotta watch out. If people have your name. I thought I had a rare name. That guy had my entire name. Luckily, there was a picture of him. The guy was much prettier than I was. So it worked out okay. It definitely wasn't me. So. All right, tonight is our third week of Beware of the Flying Monkeys. And so tonight, we are going to be talking about the Tin Man. I love the Tin Man. And so tonight, we're going to be talking about searching for heart. Searching for heart. So we're talking about searching for heart because that's what the Tin Man wanted from the Wizard of Oz, right? He went to the Wizard and he was hoping he could give him a heart. But then when he got to the Wizard, the Wizard pretty much explained he had a heart already. He just didn't have the cool stuff that went along with the heart, so he just gave him that. But all that really meant is that the wizard had a heart, and he just didn't acknowledge he had it. But the, the wizard just had to show him that's what he already had. So, when I think of heart, I think of a couple different things. One, I think of um, spikes through vampires' hearts, but that's probably not the heart we're talking about tonight. Um, but I also think of love, right? If you see a heart like that, you usually think of love and how great it is. And, and Cupid and Valentine's Day. And I think of somebody, if you think, you say something, that guy has a big heart, I usually think of, uh, you know, being kind or gentle and, and just being good that way as far as having a good heart. So I started thinking about how am I going to talk about the heart and, and what it means to us. And when I started thinking about having a big heart or a good heart or anything like that, everything I read in the Bible kind of led me to, to one section. And that, and that section was really about something that Paul talks about, which is called the fruit of the Spirit. And so, and when I say fruit, I'm not talking apples and bananas. He's talking about something completely different than that. He's talking about fruit. And a lot of times there's some confusion, because you'll notice I'm saying you were fruit of the Spirit. It's not fruits of the Spirit. There's only one fruit of the Spirit, and it actually has nine attributes. And we're going to talk about those nine attributes tonight that make up that fruit of the Spirit. And so Paul was writing a letter to the uh, guys in Galatians, and so you'll find that in Galatians, the part of the Bible. And so he was worried about some things going on there between, you know, uh, the, the Gentile Christians and some of the Mosaic Law stuff that was going on. And so he was trying to explain to them some of the things that were happening. And so in Galatians 5, 22 through 23, he says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, 
joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. And so that's where he was really talking about the Mosaic law thing, is, is people were getting confused about what they were kind of allowed to do and not allowed to do. And so, and what Paul was trying to get at is that if you are truly a Christian, those nine attributes really exist in you. And, and when I think of somebody's heart, and does that person have a big heart, these are the kind of things I think about, is do they have those attributes about that person? And so, if you look through your outline tonight, there's no fill-ins. Um, like we were doing something a little bit different this week, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about each attribute tonight of the, of the fruit of the Spirit, and then give you a little question, and I want you just to kind of, you know, privately on your outline, kind of circle yes or no, whether or not, you know, you think that that question fits you or not. And so, I want you to be honest with yourself, and you know, if you have some no's, that's not the end of the world. You know, if you're honest with yourself, you'll probably go, every once in a while it's a yes, but most of the time it's a no. And that's okay, that, that's the idea that you need to realize that stuff's out there and acknowledge it. So, so let's look through all the different attributes of the fruit of the Spirit and see which ones are kind of showing up in, our, in ourselves. And so you can kind of mark on each one. So the first one we're going to start with is love. And so this word doesn't refer to those warm feelings of puppy love that you have towards a, a fellow classmate or, or something like that, or even a true puppy. Um, if you're Hannah Swadley, that's not real love. That's that's, you know, just, that's puppy love um, for your puppy. And so, um, you know, when most people think of love, that's not really what it's about, is that. So, love, as far as the Bible's concerned, is really the deliberate way of doing good things and, and having devotion to others and, and really giving freely whether that person deserves it or not. And, and that's really hard to give freely and expect nothing back. Because when you love somebody and you think, oh, I love that person, you want them to love you back, right? I mean, you, you want, that, you want that, that return. And so to truly love, like the Bible talks about love, is you need to love without expecting anything in return. And that's really difficult. So Deuteronomy 6.5 says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your strength. So here's the question for your yes or no. And you're going to answer yes to the first part, and I'll kind of give you the, the no part here, is, am I motivated to help others because I enjoy it? Or am I giving in order to get something in return? So are, are, you, are you motivated to help others because you truly enjoy it? That's really kind of your, your yes or no on love. So next, let's talk about joy. Joy is, is a, a gladness. When you, when you say that brings joy to my life, it's really a gladness that's completely independent of good or bad things that are happening in your life. You either have a natural joy or you don't. And, and you know these people, right? You know these people that are really joyful um, and, and they always seem to be in a good mood no matter what's going on, you know. Tyler Moody the other day on Twitter posted something about, you know, hey, my car blew up, it's gonna cost me a thousand bucks to fix it, but I got to spend the day with my dad, so that's cool, right? And so that, that's just this natural joy of just, you know, having this, this good thing about him, no matter how bad things seem, he, he sees the best in it. And that's really what joy is about, is it's completely independent of the, the things that are going on in the circumstances in your life. And so Psalms 28, seven says, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in Him, and He helps me. My heart leaps for joy, and with my song, I praise Him. So the question for, for joy and I, for yes or no, is am I experiencing a joy towards life on a regular basis? Or is my happiness dependent on things going smoothly in my day? So is... Are you experiencing a joy towards life on a regular basis? Or, for the no side, would be, is it really dependent on how things go in your day? All right, so peace. The next one is peace on your outline there. This isn't really 
This isn't really saying your life doesn't have any turmoil. A lot of people think of peace and they think of, you know, this utter calm of like, you know, just bliss of meditating or something. And that's not really what this piece is talking about. This piece is really just kind of knowing that no matter what turmoil is going on in your life, that God's in control and you're going to be fine. No matter what, what goes on, you have this inner peace of knowing that God's in control and, and that everything's going to be just fine. And so Numbers 626 says, May the Lord be good to you and give you peace. So you just know that peace is coming. So the question is, can I be calm even when things go wrong? Or do I find myself disturbed by the crashing waves of turmoil in my life? Can I be calm even when things go wrong? And this is so tough, right? When things go wrong, you just want to blow a gasket and go crazy. And so having that peace of knowing it and just quickly understanding that things are going to be okay, you can calm yourself down, not, not go crazy, that's, that's a tough one to have on a continuous basis. And this next one's even tougher as far as I'm concerned. Patience. 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 It's the ability to endure. Listen to this. Listen to this. It's the ability to endure ill treatment from life or at the hands of others without lashing out and paying back that, that ill treatment that you've been getting. So kind of that, you know, have patience. No, you don't have to get your revenge or anything. And I know patience is something I struggle with a lot. And if you ever want to see me struggle with patience, take me to Target or Walmart and let me get in line. And all I do the entire time I'm in line is watch the other lines to see if I made a good decision for the line I'm in, right? That, that's all I do the whole time I'm in line. It's like, dang it, I knew I should have taken that line. And usually I blame it on my wife and then say like, you picked the wrong line. We could have been out here 10 minutes ago if we have just taken that line. And so I have no patience, right? I know going into Target or Walmart, I'm going to have to wait in line. We all know that, right? It's part of the hell that is going to Target and Walmart. But part of that is, is waiting in line. But for some reason, we still lose our mind the minute we have to. It's like, oh, I can't believe I have to wait. It's like, it's like waiting in the lunchroom, right? You guys have to wait that long on line sometimes to buy your lunch. That's an ugly, right? You just lose your mind. So, Revelation 14.12 says, This calls for patient endurance on the part of the people of God who keep his commands and remain faithful in Jesus. And that's the hard part, is that patient endurance. Just, just knowing that you need to be patient and, and being okay with that and enduring on through that and just continuing on and having that patience. So your question is, Am I easily set off when things go wrong or people irritate me? Or am I able to keep a godly perspective during life's irritations? Yep. Lots of, lots of uh, I wish on that one, right? Uh, probably lots of, I wish I could circle yes here, but I'm in church. I'll probably be lying. So, all right. So next, next one is kindness. Kindness. So when kindness is working in somebody's life, what they're doing is they're always looking for a way to meet somebody else's needs. And, and so it, it's this goodness in them that just kind of overflows. And, and it's just no matter what's going on, they're, they're always just trying to be helpful. And they don't really have this malice thing about them where you're worried that they might kind of do something that's, you know, selfish or anything. And, and I know there's definitely some people in this church that I think of when I think of kindness that... No matter what's going on, they seem like the type of people that would just give me the shirt off their back if I asked for it or would gladly help me with it, whatever is going on. And, and so that kindness is just this, this sense that you get about people, right? You realize that, you know, no matter what happens, they're just naturally kind, good people. And, and that's really hard to fake for a very long period of time, right? They can fake it for a little while and you can really read through somebody trying to fake kindness, right? That whole kill them with kindness when somebody's being fate kind to you. I mean, you can read that a mile away. So being truly kind is definitely tough. So Ephesians 4.32 says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. So 
Forgiving is part of that whole kindness and, and, and just being able to, to look past that. So the question for tonight for kindness for yes or no is, is it my goal to show kindness to others or am I too focused on my own needs, desires, or problems? Is it your goal to show kindness to others? Do you go to school thinking, who can I be nice to today that I wasn't nice to yesterday? Man, that's tough, right? So that's the question. Is it my goal to show kindness to others? It's, not, it's one thing just to say, yeah, I'm nice to people, but is it your goal to show kindness to others? So next is goodness. Goodness is kind of a funny little word. and it, it, I guess you could describe it in a couple different ways. And I'd say that kindness is, is kind of the soft side of good. And while goodness is really just this, this character that reflects that's a lot like God, really. Um, goodness in you is, is really the desire to see goodness in other people. When, if you have true goodness in you, you're happy when your friend does really well at something that you wish you had done well at also. When you have goodness in you, you, you know, you're not spiteful about things that happen. You're, you're always very thankful and, you know, willing to forgive and just have this natural goodness about you. And you don't confront people, you, you know, about every little detail. Um, you, you know, you just have this natural thing about you that's, that's good. And that's definitely a, a hard thing to do 24 hours a day. In Psalms 23.6 says, Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. And that's an awesome verse because it means God wants you to be good. And, and he's, he's working to, to make sure that you're good and, and reminding you when you're not good. And, and, and he's the example of that goodness. And if you just read the Bible and, and listen to him, he'll show you how to be good and have that goodness in you. So the question for goodness is, do I desire to see others experience God's goodness in their lives, or am I satisfied with my own personal walk? Do I desire to see others experience God's goodness in their lives, or am I satisfied with my own personal walk? So that's really one of those, you know, are, do you usually just say, I can't worry about them, I've just got to worry about me? Or are, are you truly worried about others and you want to help them in what they're doing? All right, next one. Three left. Faithfulness. Faithfulness. A faithful person is one with real integrity, really. And so this is somebody that other people can, and can use as an example. Um, and, and it's somebody that, you know, has this naturally, you know, it, just kind of has this thing where you kind of feel like they're in charge because you can trust them um, and, and you just feel like they're not going to do anything that's going to lead you wrong and, and they just have this, this faithfulness about them that you just trust them with, with everything. Are, are you that person? Are you that person that other people go, man, I really just trust that person and if, if they said this is what we need to do, then let's just go do it because we, we trust them. To, to you know, not not do anything bad, and you know they just want to seek out you know good in people, and, and really kind of show the glory of God, and you know is that you for faithfulness? Psalm fifty one six says, "Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb; you taught me wisdom in that secret place. Yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb." And so this is really just saying, from the very beginning, that's, that's really all God wants from you, is, is that you're faithful and, and you have integrity. Integrity is one of those things I always tell teenagers and other people is, integrity is that one thing that only you can take away from yourself. Nobody else can ruin your integrity but you. You're the only person that can mess that up. Other people can try, but you're really the only person that can mess up your integrity and your faithfulness. So you have to be very protective of your integrity all the time. So the question is, do I maintain a high level of personal integrity and am accountable to my friends? Or do I speak and act different around select people? Do I maintain a high level of personal integrity and am accountable to my friends? Or do I speak and act differently around select people? All right. Next one, gentleness. Oh, it just kind of reminds me of like a teddy bear, right? Like, oh, so gentle. So 
Um, I can tell you most guys do not like to be defined as gentle. That's just not a, it's not very, it's not really a masculine quality to be defined as gentle. You kind of think of them as like this gentle little teddy bear person or whatever. But anyway, um, but realize that gentleness is, is a little bit different. Meekness is not weakness. And, and so that's a kind of a, a common phrase. Um, and gentleness is not without power. It's just a, a power that defers to, to give rather than to, to take and, and use it in the wrong way. So it forgives others, it corrects with kindness. You know, it's, it's a, you just have, somebody has a gentle heart, you can tell that about them because they don't lash out and, and they just try to help you no matter what's going on. You probably had some gentle teachers, believe it or not, in your day that no matter how bad you tried to screw up, they always want to try to guide you back down the right path. Um, those are gentle qualities. In Philippians 4 or 5, it says, Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. And so being gentle isn't something you get to select to do to certain people. It's something you need to live your life by and be gentle to all in the way you deal with them. It's almost the way I kind of think of gentleness is, is kind of the way you might treat maybe your grandma, right? It's like grandmas can do some crazy stuff. And if it was just some, if it was a teenager that said some of the stuff that your grandma might say to you, you'd be like, what? You're ready to, you know, squat up on somebody. But when your grandma says something silly, you're like, oh, grandma, you're so funny, right? That's that gentleness that you, you show to somebody. You gotta be careful that you use that, you know, with everybody, not just grandma when she says something that she shouldn't have. So, question, question for gentleness. Do I come across to others as arrogant or stubborn and stubborn or am I allowing the grace of God to flow through me to others? Do I come across to others as arrogant or stubborn? I know I do sometimes. Whew. Or am I allowing the grace of God to flow through me to others? All right. And the last one, the last one, self-control. Self-control. The code word is self-control. All right. Self-control. Self-control is tough because our fleshly desires want us to do all sorts of stuff that is not in God's spirit at all. And so self-control is literally releasing our grip on, that, on those fleshly desires and realizing we don't have to do those things and, and that we can be choose to be just kind of controlled by the Holy Spirit. And so it's so hard to have self-control when it's talking about your friends are doing it. So, then it, you know, self-control is, you have self-control with peer pressure. You have self-control when, you know, you know, other people are doing it or, you know, just because you see Miley Cyrus twerking on TV doesn't mean you should be twerking at home. Right? You should not be out buying foam fingers and doing things with foam fingers at your house just because Miley Cyrus did. You need some self-control, right? So self-control is really just realizing that there's things out there that your body wants to do, but you realize you shouldn't be doing those. That's really what self-control is all about. So Proverbs 28, 25, 28 says, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. And really what that says is that if you lack self-control, it's just gonna be kind of a train wreck for your life because you're always gonna be jumping from one thing to the next and, and not really be able to focus on anything and kind of go wherever it is. And if you have some self-control, you can, you can get on a path and follow that path and stick with it. So your question for self-control is, are my fleshly desires controlling my life or am I allowing the spirit to direct me to the things that please God? Are my fleshly desires controlling my life, or am I allowing the Spirit to direct me to the things that please God? Ariana's going to serenade me with a beautiful uh, acoustic melody here just for a few minutes. Okay. Yeah. So, 
So listen up. So we talked about all the attributes of the fruit of the Spirit tonight. You took your little quiz. I don't want to see the answers to your quiz, but I want you to hold on to your quiz. I want you to take that quiz home. I want you to think about each one of those and how you did at those. And think about, do you have the fruit of the Spirit in you? If you look at each one of those things in all your actions that you do, do you have the fruit of the Spirit living in you? And so tonight I have three next steps. And if you look at your connection card in your bulletin there, which you need to go ahead and fill out, we're going to collect them here in a few minutes. There's three next steps in there, and two of them should be pretty easy for everybody. The first one is, I will read more about the fruit of the Spirit. Hopefully I've, I've piqued your interest in some of the fruit of the Spirit stuff tonight. And maybe you need to spend a little bit of your Bible time just looking up some of these words in the Bible. I dare you to look up the word love in the Bible and try to find every verse that mentions the word love. That'll take care of you for the rest of the year. There's plenty of, use each one of those words and just try to do your own research. And what does the Bible say about this? fruit of the Spirit. What, what does it say about this attribute of the fruit of the Spirit? Next is, I will tell someone about the fruit of the Spirit. This week, use this message as a time to kind of gently talk to a friend about church and just tell them maybe about this crazy sermon you heard from this guy and he talked about the attribute of the fruit of the Spirit and how you're struggling with one of them. Maybe, maybe that's the best way to start the conversation is, man, I really struggle with self-control, don't you? Did you know that this, right, what a great way to start a conversation with somebody. And the third next step is, if you don't have Jesus in your life, maybe tonight's tonight you need to make that decision that you need to make him the Lord of your life. Because you just realize you don't have any of those attributes in your life. And you need that in your life to keep you centered and keep you on task. And so tonight, maybe that's what you need to ask for during this prayer is that Jesus just come into your life and be the Lord of your life. So if you guys would go ahead and bow your head, I'm going to close out prayer for you. God, thank you for tonight that we can just come here and just talk about things that we should have in our heart. God, if we just talk about all these, these attributes, God, we realize that it's hard to have these 24 hours a day, seven days a week. God, we just ask that you just start to work in our life, God, and just make it easier for us, God, to have these attributes in our life when we need them. God, I just thank you for the students that are here tonight, God, that are hopefully making a decision to just to live a better life, God, to, to realize they're lacking in their heart in some areas, and they're going to make a change tonight because of that. God, thank you for what's happening in this youth group. In your name we pray. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Come on up and worship with the band.